As I come into your presence, Lord, I bow down on my knees, for I see myself the way I truly am. Oh, I know that I'm not worthy to receive the love you give, but you said if I repent, you would forgive. So I'm asking for forgiveness, Lord, as I forsake my sin. I believe that you can make me whole again. Wash me in your precious blood, cleanse me from within. Uphold me with your righteous hand again. I was bound by sin that held me, how I long to be set free. How I need to sense that peace and joy again. So I'm casting all my burdens at the foot of Calvary's cross And I place my life within those nail-scarred hands So I'm asking for forgiveness, Lord, as I forsake my sin I believe that you can make me whole again Wash me in your precious blood, cleanse me from my sin. Restore me with your righteous hand again. I'm pleading for mercy, for I am so lost. I know now my sins place the nails in your so I'm asking for forgiveness, Lord, as I forsake my sin. I believe that you can make me whole again. Wash me in your precious blood, cleanse me from within. Uphold me with your righteous hand. Again, uphold me with your righteous hand. Again, let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, we have one simple request today, and that would be that you would pour out your spirit upon us. Now, that one request entails many different things, Lord. We pray that you would open our ears and our hearts that we would be able to hear, that you would soften our hearts that what is said will penetrate deep into our lives. And Lord, most importantly, I pray that you would empower me with the gift of your spirit, and enable me to share the words that you have given me today so that the message will ring clear and true to us, that we will go away from this place this morning having been changed more into the image and likeness of Jesus. That is our desire, and that is our request, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. The fragrance of forgiveness. I'd like for you to take your Bibles with me this morning as we begin our little journey together. Matthew chapter 26, verses 27 and 28. Matthew chapter 26, verses 27 and 28. A couple of verses that we often use during communion. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul recites this verse, actually. In Matthew chapter 26, and looking at verses 27 and 28, 
The Bible says, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Jesus wanted the disciples to understand without the shedding of blood, which they had witnessed over and over again through the temple services, without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission, and remission is pardon or forgiveness of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there would simply be no forgiveness of sin. Now, if you follow me back to Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, we will see how Paul reiterates this statement of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, Paul reemphasizes this importance of the shedding of blood and the forgiveness or remission of sins. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, the Bible says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So for you and I, that should be a very powerful statement to realize that if Jesus had not have been willing to lay down his life on the cross and shed his blood for you and for me, we would simply have no hope. And you know, we have such a good God. God gave the Israelites the sanctuary service so that through every act of that sanctuary service, they could have a mini picture of the plan of salvation. But every time there was a sacrifice made, they were reminded of the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. There's a beautiful statement in the Signs of the Times, January 2, 1893. It says, the great truth that was to be kept before men and imprinted upon the mind and heart was this. Without shedding of blood is no remission. In everything, excuse me, in every bleeding sacrifice was typified the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Many forgot the true significance of these offerings and the great truth that through Christ alone there is forgiveness of sins. Now, you know, I know that if you're like me, over the course of your life, you go to a lot of communion services. You do a lot of foot washings. And sometimes repetition can make us get to a place where we become numb to really what it all means. The children of Israel were giving sacrifices over and over. And after a while, it simply became something that you do. It's a ritual, a part of my life. Brothers and sisters, this morning, don't let the communion service become just a ritual or something that you do once a quarter. Recognize the beautiful benefit of remembering what all of this represents and what it means to you and me today. That last line, the great truth that through Christ alone, there is forgiveness of sins. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, there's a verse that we all know very well. It says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And I want you to look at something even more special. Go to Acts chapter 5 and verse 31. Acts chapter 5 and verse 31, as we think about the remission of sin and God's giving us forgiveness, but if you look at Acts chapter 5, there's something even more beautiful that we see in a statement that is made. Acts chapter 5 and verse 31, the Bible says, Him hath God exalted at His right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Do you realize that it's only Jesus that can actually give you and me the desire for repentance? If it weren't for Jesus, we wouldn't even have the desire for repentance in our lives. Another statement in Desire of Ages 175 says, Through faith we receive the grace of God. You know Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith, right? But then it says, but faith is not our Savior. It earns nothing. It is the hand by which we lay hold upon Christ and appropriate his merits, the remedy for sin. And we cannot even repent without the aid of the Spirit of God. 
Repentance comes from Christ as truly as does pardon. So every communion service that we regular, regularly participate in, we get the opportunity to be reminded of the sacrifice of Jesus and to remember that without that sacrifice, we could not have forgiveness. And without that forgiveness, we simply would have no hope. But you know, we celebrate each time his cleansing, his forgiveness, and his love. But Jesus calls us for more. Do you believe that God calls you to a higher calling? You know, he didn't just save us to leave us where we are. He calls us to come up higher. He wants us to be more like him, to reflect him more and more. So as he has forgiven us, he calls us to take on a trait of his character that we will forgive others. Let's go to our text for today, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 30. And let's read again what Everett shared so beautifully with us earlier. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 30. There's a couple of things that I hope that we will see in what Paul is saying here. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 30. The Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. I want you to notice it was kind of reversed, but do you know that when you forgive someone, then you look at verse 31, and the bitterness and the wrath and the anger, clamor, evil speaking, and malice will all be put away. When I truly have forgiven someone, I have put away those things and I'm not still looking for vengeance or revenge or I'm not still hoping they get what they deserve. I've given it to God and I have let it go. You may have seen the sign out front today. Horace Bushnell once said, forgiveness is man's deepest need and his greatest achievement. Someone else once said, he who cannot forgive others breaks the bridge over which he himself must pass if he would reach heaven. For everyone has need to be forgiven. Amen. You know, if you think about your own experience, it's often easier to forgive an enemy than it is a close friend. Have you ever experienced that? It seems that when somebody very close to us does something, it goes a little deeper and it's a little harder to let go. The fragrance of forgiveness is to see the beauty and the growth of character that comes from learning to forgive as Jesus has forgiven us. Now, I want you to think with me for a minute. There, I'm sure, is some point in your life that you have been hurt. Anybody ever been hurt this morning? There's some point in our lives that we've been hurt. In fact, there's probably some of us here today who are hurting from something someone else has done. In fact, I would venture to say that there are some who are not with us today who are hurting from what someone else has done to them. The question is, do we learn in life how to deal with the pain and the hurting? Do we learn how we deal with the emotions and the feelings? And the answer lies in the act of forgiving. You remember, I'm sure you've seen in the news the last few days, this horrific thing that has gone on with these parents that have had 13 children that have been kept in their home and essentially lived a life of torture. They said that the 29-year-olds and the 26-year-olds look like little children. They're so malnourished and they've been so truly cre um, treated, cruelly treated, I truly treated. It was cruelly treated. but. But it's, it's a horrendous thing when you read this story. And you know, I was looking at an article and someone actually said, will those children be able to forgive their parents? You know, when something really bad happens to us, it's hard to forgive. It's hard to let go. But we need to remember how Jesus has forgiven us. I want to share with you this morning, you know, and I was going to tell the story, but I hope you'll forgive me because I feel like that this man's testimony, uh, you need to hear every word so that you understand. 
Reverend Walter H. Everett answered the phone unprepared for the words that he heard. Scott, his son, was murdered the night before. Walter's anger toward his son's killer raged through him like a violent riptide, growing even worse when a plea bargain resulted in a reduced sentence for the attacker. My rage was affecting my entire life. How am I going to let go of this anger, I wondered. The answer came the first time I saw Mike, the attacker, almost a year after Scott's death. Mike stood in the court prior to his sentencing and said that he was truly sorry for what he had done. Three and a half weeks later, on the first anniversary of Scott's death, I wrote to Mike. I told him about my anger and asked some pointed questions, and then I wrote, having said all that, I want to thank you for what you said in court, and as hard as these words are for me to write, I forgive you. I wrote God's love in Christ and invited Mike to write me if he wished. Now, I want you to understand what forgiveness can do. I want you to understand how it can change a life and things can be turned not only in your life, but in the one that you forgive. He goes on to say three weeks later, his letter arrived. He said that when he had read my letter, he couldn't believe it. No one had ever said to him, I forgive you. That night, he knelt beside his bed and prayed and received the forgiveness of Jesus. Additional correspondence led to regular visits during which we spoke often of Mike's and my growing experience with Christ. Later, I spoke on Mike's behalf before a parole board. He was given an early release. In November of 1994, I was officiating the officiating minister at his wedding. When asked about his early release, Mike says, it felt good, but I was already out of prison. God had set me free when I asked for his forgiveness. Can I truly forgive? I had wondered if it were possible, but I've discovered the meaning of the Apostle Paul's words, for freedom Christ has set us free. I want you to consider the following thoughts about forgiveness this morning. Number one, forgiveness is an act of love. It's a choice. It's not necessarily a feeling. Forgiveness is something that we do. In fact, in John 3, 16, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God cho chose to forgive before we ever asked for forgiveness. Number two, we all need forgiveness. Without God's forgiveness, there would be no future. It would be die, turn to dust, and that's it. As we respond to what others have done to us, we must never forget what we have done to God. Remembering our own sinfulness equals mercy. Number three, forgiveness is about responsibility. Many of us grew up in homes that when a problem or incident occurred, more time and energy were spent on trying to find out who it was we could blame rather than how to fix the problem. Have you ever experienced that? So we learned how to blame someone else when things don't go exactly the way we think they should. Remember Adam and Eve? We began to learn how to use the blame game, and blame game, and we say, it's not my fault, it's everyone else's. It's my parents' fault, it's my spouse's, it's the church's. I know you know what I'm saying. I had an experience with a lady a few years ago. We were talking, and she was talking about all the problems that she was having in the church and all the things that she were do was doing that was contrary to what she knew the church and what was right in God's eyes. And she looked at me and she said, it's my parents' fault. And she blamed her parents for everything that had gone wrong in her life. And I said, you know, I understand how you feel. But I said, God did give you the power of choice. You could choose to keep blaming your parents, or you could choose to forgive and move on and let God take you to new places. When life isn't fair, there's two choices. We can either forgive or we can blame. And we often want to substitute blame for being accountable. 
And sometimes we go so far as to use those things that we call inner vows. You know, where I make a statement and a determine. I say to myself, I'll never let anyone do that to me again. No one will ever hurt me like that again. And when we make those inner vows, sometimes they have the reverse response and effect. Sometimes when we make those vows, we close the doors to the love, the forgiveness, the tenderness, the kindness that God wants us to experience because we've shut ourselves in to protect. Remember that no matter what has happened to you, happened in the past. And the only way to keep the past alive is right here in our thoughts. You remember the old VCRs? I remember when we used to watch something on a VCR and then you'd have to sit there and push rewind and you'd listen to it going... And you'd have to sit there for minutes watching this thing while it rewound so you could watch what you wanted to watch again. That's what we do, though, sometimes with hurt. We will play it over and over in our our mind. We will just rewind it again and let it happen over and over. But God wants us to be able to put that stuff aside and to move forward. Now, go with me to Philippians chapter 4. It's a verse that you know really well. But the question is, do you put it into practical practice in your life? When you're going through those times where someone has hurt you or you're feeling pain, are you able to follow through with what Paul suggests here? Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. The Bible says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, it's it's a matter of choice. It's a matter of a decision that I make. I'm going to choose by the grace of God to think positively in my life. You see, it's your actions, not those of someone else that define who you are. Did you hear what I said? It's your actions, not those of someone else, that define who you are. 90% of life, they say, is attitude, and 10% is circumstance. No, you can't always change your circumstances, but you can certainly change how you react to your circumstances. Forgiveness is freedom. It is miraculous how the power of forgiveness can affect not only the offender, but it can free the injured. You know, one of the most beautiful stories I've ever heard on forgiveness was one that Corey Ten Boom tells. You know, she suffered through all of those years in a Nazi prison camp. She went through torture. She went through starvation, privation, all of those things, and even witnessed the death of her dear sister. It was after the war, and she was going around touring and and sharing things with people about what took place, giving inspirational talks. And she was giving a talk one day, and at the end of that talk, as she stood at the door greeting people as they were leaving, a man came walking forward, and as she looked into his eyes, she immediately remembered that he was the soldier that had had her sister killed. In her heart... All kinds of turmoil was going on. You can imagine what it must have been like for her standing there looking eye to eye to this man who had caused so much pain in her life and seen the death of her sister. And she was looking straight into this man's eyes and he started to have tears coming down from his eyes and he reached his hand out and asked for her forgiveness. Can you imagine what was going through her heart? I'm sure things like, Lord, how could you expect me to ever forgive someone like this? But she knew in her heart she had to forgive him. And when she reached out to take his hand and to say, I forgive you, she said that it was at that very moment in her life that she felt most intensely the love of God that she had ever felt. You see, the power of forgiveness can change everything in someone's life. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that that prisoner was you. To receive forgiveness, we must also be willing to forgive ourselves. I want you to look with me at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. 
Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. It's a statement that he makes that you may think, well, boy, that's, that's pretty hard, Lord. That's a, that's a pretty hard statement. But I want you to consider the reason why Jesus said it. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. He said, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Why does Jesus call us to forgive? Because forgiveness is part of the salvation process. It is part of becoming like Him. And quite frankly, if we don't become like Him, we won't be spending eternity with Him. Jesus is the ultimate example of forgiveness. You remember as He hung on that cross, paying the penalty for you and for me, As he died on that cross, as he looked at those who were crucifying him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, even the priests and the Pharisees, those who had done everything they could to get him crucified, even those men didn't really understand the full impact of what they were doing. He came to seek and to save the lost, and they rejected him. They scorned him, they crucified him, they cursed him. And this is a beautiful saying that reminds me of what took place for you and for me. It says, forgiveness is the perfume the trampled flower cast back on the foot that crushed it. Forgiveness is the perfume the trampled flower cast back on the foot that crushed it. The fragrance of forgiveness is freedom. Forgiveness is about a converted heart. We can't do it on our own. It's a gift from God. He has promised in his word that he will change our hearts from a hard heart of stone to a warm heart of love, compassion, and forgiveness. Forgiveness is man's deepest need and his greatest achievement. Today, as we are reminded once again of the forgiveness of Christ and the cleansing that he wants to give us, may we also remember to forgive others as he has forgiven us. As we partake of the ordinance of humility and communion, let Jesus change our hearts today. And I don't know if we've got it. uh, Is it ready to put up on the screen? Before we go into our ordinance of humility this morning, I want us to sing this song together. It's one that I think most of us know, but I had it put up on the screen just in case you don't know all the words. We'll sing it a cappella. It's changed my heart, O God. Most of you know that, I think, don't you? And I want you to think about what we're asking Jesus to do today because this morning, as we go to our ordinance of humility, that's the opportunity that we have to ask Jesus to cleanse my heart as my feet are washed. Let's sing this together. Change my heart, O God. Make it heaven new. Change my heart, O God. May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, O God, make it heaven new. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. As we go for the ordinance of humility, may that be the prayer that is in our hearts.